Well, good morning. <laughs> what a joy to be here. Father, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for the uh, facility here, Lord, that you've maintained and blessed. And thank you for the body of Christ here that is obviously growing. What a, what a joy to see your work continuing. And so we, we, uh, we're grateful to you. Every good and perfect gift comes down from you. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would open each of our hearts to you today. Give us, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. I've never been in a situation like this before, so I'm just trying to kind of find my, my sea legs here a little bit. Uh, it is really a thrill to be here. I, I, I can't even, you know, express it. Uh, I had believed that uh, the Lord was going to continue his work here and that one day it would, it would continue and continue and continue. And obviously that is happening. And uh, Paul, is that you out there? Yeah, that's you. Paul? Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, and so, you know, from my perspective, having been here for 45 or 46 years, something like that, it's, uh, you know, you don't have this kind of an experience <laughs> very often in life. And so, uh, I love you guys that I know, I, I love you so much. Well, that ends my message for the day. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, let, me, let me just get into the message here, okay? I think I'll just do that. Ephesians chapter one. It says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You know, so often we uh, overlook an opening verse or two in, the, in a letter in the New Testament. It seems like it's very similar to all the other letters. And we can often, uh, we often can uh, not realize the blessings that are here in these first couple of verses for example, in the uh, second part of verse 1, you have a twofold description of what a Christian is. He says, to the, it's actually three, to the saints, which means to be set apart, it's a threefold actually, to the saints who are in Ephesus, Excuse me, it's a two-part. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. 
A Christian is someone whom God has called out of darkness, out of the kingdom of darkness, out of death, and has set them apart for his exclusive use. Uh, you belong to God as a Christian. And the word saint means to be set apart. Um, and when, you, when he saved you, he took you and he set you apart to himself. We're set apart to him. So that's the first part of a description of a Christian is they have been set apart by the grace of God to Jesus Christ. And the second description of a Christian is in the word faithful, which doesn't mean what you think it means. It simply means they were actively believing, not being faithful in the sense of you know, always being faithful, but is faithful, a person who has a real relationship with God, uh, believing in God, and uh, a, a real intimacy with God, and con continuing in that intimacy with Him. And so, uh, what a joy then to know what a Christian is. Uh, it's someone who God has made His own child, He has set you apart to Himself, and uh, he's, he's given you that relationship as a child of his. But the, the, the uh, letter to the Ephesians, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, what, what does this letter mean? What, why was it written? And it actually was written to encourage the people in Ephesus, as well as uh, some of the other churches that were nearby. The letter was called an encyclical letter, meaning it would be given to one church and then it would be sent to another church and then sent to another church. And so it's, uh, it's regarded by Bible uh, believers, Bible scholars, Bible authorities, if you will, to possibly be the, the greatest letter that Paul ever wrote. Uh, people might argue the book of Romans, uh, and I wouldn't argue with you, but it, that's obviously very great too. But this letter uh, is superb in so many ways. And... Um, I just would encourage you to become very familiar with it. But uh, Paul, had, Paul knew the people that he was writing to. He'd actually pastored that church for a few years. And when he was there, uh, the, the things that he's going to teach us in this first this chapter, when he was with them in Ephesus, he had taught them these things already. So what, he was, what he's saying here in the letter to them wasn't new because he had preached all of this to them. But the reason he wrote these things to them is because he understood that like you and I, they were in a spiritual battle and that the devil is a liar, he's a thief and he's a murderer and he seeks to assault Christians. And so Paul understood that the devil was always trying to disturb the church and Christians need to be encouraged and they need to be re-encouraged so often. Also, he wrote them this letter of encouragement because he knows that we tend to forget the things that we know, like what you might have had for lunch yesterday. See, <laughs> you forgot it already. And so he wanted to, you know, strengthen them in their faith by teaching them the Bible. And uh, he wanted to remind them of things that they knew and could be encouraged in them. He wanted them to grow, of course, in, in grace. And he also, if you, you know, if you read this letter, you would find out that he was very conscious of the evil that was in the day that this letter was written. Very, 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 very evil. And uh, he wanted them to stand strong against the lies that were being put upon the church. And, you know, you, you think it's a letter of encouragement. You say, well, how, what would, how would you start a letter of encouragement to, to somebody? And you might think, well, let's start with a long list of do's and don'ts. <laughs> and thank God he didn't do that. He didn't say, now do this and do that and do this and do that, do this and do that. In fact, the Bible doesn't even say that. The Bible says, look what God has done for you. What God has done for you. The, the, if you took the teaching of the, the whole Bible 
and tried to, to put it together. What direction, what, what's the, the, the main message of the Bible? It points us to God. It points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we praise him for his goodness and his glory because the Bible tells us in the beginning, God. And it ends in the last book of uh, Revelation. It's what God's done with a new creation. And, well, aren't there do's and don'ts? Well, actually, what there are are people who have been set apart to God and are believing in him. And as we, as he reveals himself to us, and as he reveals to us what he's done for us, you know what it does for us? It, it turns us into worshipers. We just want to worship the Lord. And, and you know, worship isn't do this and do that. Uh, worship is, Lord, I love you. I can hardly believe how good you are. And um, so really what Paul is doing is he's keeping, he's keeping uh, right on track with the whole message of the Bible, which starts with, look what God has done for you and learn what God has done for you and understand what God has done for you and embrace what God has done for you and begin to rejoice in what God has done for you and, and begin to live in that understanding of what God has done for you. And that kind of a life is a life of uh, overflow. It's a life of joy. It's a life of witness. And, and again, you don't go witnessing. You, you become a witness for Christ. And you, you, uh, we minister out of the overflow of our life. And, you know, we become conscious of who, who's the person I just said hello to. I'm out on, at the supermarket or wherever I might be and becoming aware, now I wonder if that person has what I have. Because what I have, and what you have if you're a Christian, we have this treasure, we have eternal life, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I, like you, there was a time when I didn't, and the people I'm looking at, I don't know if they have that treasure or not. But I know that Jesus said to let our lights shine, because those people, that don't have this treasure are going through everything that you went through before you became a Christian, or perhaps worse. One of the things that uh, I've been trying to do for the last few years is to mention the name of Jesus to every person I meet every day. And I, I don't hit them with the Bible. I you know, bend over and let me hit you here. I don't do that. But you know, you're just there. You just, and, and again, it's, it's natural. You're not going, well, now I didn't, you know, I've got to, Witness, it just, it's, uh, you want to tell people about Jesus. But what I try to do is, uh, in a natural way, however the conversation is going, like, boy, gosh, you know, God, or I mean, Jesus, really gave us a beautiful day out here today, didn't he? And you can test what, you're like throwing your, you know, Jesus said, you follow me, then I'll make you fishers of men. So when you're fishing, you throw your bait out there and you're looking, is, we got any nibbles on it? And so when you mention the name of Jesus, you're gonna see there's a nibble, there's a bite, or they're running for the hills. And, uh, but that is possibly you're opening a door, the Lord's opening a door. And how do we know that that person who maybe even turned their back on you and, and went home, maybe cursing under their breath and blankly blank blank Christians, and later that night, the fact that the name of Jesus had been mentioned to them, the Holy Spirit took that name, that person, and begin to reveal to that person the great grace and love of God for them. And so uh, it is a joy. It is a joy to tell people about Jesus. And, and uh, I would encourage you, make it your business to do that because uh, how, you know, it's not, it's not right that if, if we've got, if we have the answer to life and other people don't, it's not right that we don't, don't share it. Right, so, so, but anyways, back to this letter. Uh, no do's and don'ts, but really a refresher course in what God has done for you. Very specifically in this first chapter, there's probably uh, 12 or 13 specific blessings that belong to you if you're a Christian. And so Paul was giving them a refresher course 
in what they already knew. And in these blessings that he lists for us here, he deals with questions such as, well, how is salvation actually accomplished? I mean, that, that, that thought is uh, worth thinking about. How, how is it salvation actually accomplished? How does God actually save somebody? Uh, why did God save you? How did God save you? What does God have in store for you once you leave this world? And another reason that Paul would emphasize these, uh, these Bible truths, and um, by the way, these, these particular Bible truths here, these are, the, these are the Bible truths that seem to be like posts stipping, stick, uh, sticking up all through the Bible. These are the, the main truths of salvation. These are the things that you'll see all through the Bible uh, and, uh, and, and explained so well in the New Testament. Um, and the reason that Paul would specifically hone in on these is because these doctrinal or te it's the teaching, the teaching here is necessary. Well, let me ask you, why do you think it would be necessary to have this teaching? Let me say this. They're necessary because a right God-honoring behavior always springs from right beliefs. So to, to, to walk rightly before God, to honor God, doesn't just happen. It happens because the word of God has been taken in, received richly, uh, understood and embraced and so on. And, and it's, that's what causes us then to walk in the right way. And of course today, in speaking of evil, uh, there's like a tsunami of evil coming from uh, 360 degrees and you're in the middle of it. And it's, it's not even over yet, it's just, just getting going. And so here we are, a light. The, the, the Lord shone his light upon you one day. You didn't know him. You, you might have thought you were okay, you know. You didn't know him, but, but he knew you. And so uh, with those things in mind, uh, as you notice in verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And it's no surprise, it's not any news to anybody that God has been blessing his people from the beginning of creation. You know, Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter two, and Genesis chapter three, the creation, and then the fall of man where the devil came and tempted Eve, and Adam actually knew exactly what he was doing. Eve was deceived. Adam knew she was being deceived, and he forfeited uh, his relationship with God there. But right as soon as they sinned, one of the first things that God said to them after they sinned, he, he gave them what is called the first mention of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's there in chapter 3, verse 15. In fact, that, that ends the Old Testament. And from there, you have the New Testament, which is the, the story of how God is, is bringing Jesus Christ, who is the gospel, how God is bringing Jesus Christ to the world. In chapter 3, verse 15, he, he prophesies to them that the seed of uh, the woman, actually referring to Mary, would, would bear a child whose heel would be bitten by the devil. But he would then crush the head of that devil and that snake. And we're told in the book of 1 John chapter 3, Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. So God blesses his people. God blesses his people. He blesses his people. We didn't know that before we were Christians. He blesses his people. And so uh, he's blessing us today. He's blessing you today. In fact, 
These verses say it all right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God is both faithful to do what he says he will do, and he's faithful to never change his mind. And so just as he blessed the Ephesians, he does it, he's done it for us by giving us this letter here because it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's uh, really very uh, interesting to notice that uh, in this first chapter, you have God's description of his plan for salvation. Here you have God's description of his plan for salvation. And it's broken up from the past, the present, and the future. That's one way of looking at these first 14 verses, or even really the whole chapter. It's the, it's the master plan of God. This is what he's intending to do and is doing and has done, showing us the past, the present, and the future. And another way of looking at this first chapter is that each member of the Godhead is involved in this master plan of salvation. In other words, as we begin now to look at the blessings that are in this chapter, you'll notice, first of all, it tells us the blessings that the Father has given to us, and then he goes on to talk about the blessings that the Son has given to us, and then he talks about the blessings that the Holy Spirit has given to us. So it's really nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's just absolutely wonderful. And so the Father's blessings, we're going to start with that in, in verses uh, 4 through 6. And the first blessing from our Father is mentioned there in verse 4. And he says here, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I like to say that uh, he has chosen us, and this is the marvelous doctrine of election. Just as, he's, he's, he's saying, guys, I want you to hear how the Father has blessed you. Number one, before the world was even created, he chose you for something. And he chose you that you would be holy or set apart and that you would be without blame before him in love. And if you're a Christian today, you are set apart to God, as we had mentioned. And in terms of being justified by God, when he looks at you today, he looks at you just as if you'd never sinned. It's without blame. There is, therefore, in Romans chapter 8, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, that's what it says, period. You can't take anything. <laughs> Why take, try to take something away from that? And the reason he, the reason he looks at us this way, that, and... Let me slow down. When I really get going, I start spinning around in this chair. But uh, um, election is always unto something. So he chose you to be set apart to God. He chose you to be without blame. If you're a Christian today, from God's perspective, which is accurate, you are without blame. Because when he declared you to be righteous, it means that he removed your sin to put on Jesus Christ, who paid the price for it, and he then imputed to you the very righteousness of Christ. When the father looks at the son who's sitting right to his right, how do you think he looks at him? Does, does he look at him and say, now, Jesus, your feet are dirty or something? I mean, no, he, this is his son. He's pure. He's holy. And if you are in Christ, we say, well, what, what, what about my failures yesterday or this morning? Well, yeah, those are very real, but you're standing before him. Uh, when your children misbehave, yeah, they misbehave, but they're still your children. And uh, that's who you are. So he's, he's chosen you uh, to be set apart to him. Uh, a real great pastor, Warren Wiersbe, 
his professor once said to him, if you try to explain election, you might lose your mind. If you try to explain it away and say, well, it isn't there, you might lose your soul. The fact is that salvation begins with God and not with man. It's a fact. In John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The book of Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 11 essentially says the lost sinner left to his own ways does not seek God. Luke 19.10 tells us God in his love seeks the sinner. So God chose you even before the universe was created so that our salvation is holy by his grace and not on the basis of anything we've done. Pastor Chuck Smith, uh, my pastor and Pastor Michael's pastor as well, he's now in heaven, uh, seven years I think it's been, ten years, oh my, ten years. He quoted a famous pastor from England, Charles Spurgeon, and he said, Pastor Chuck said this concerning the doctrine of election, that God chose him before the foundation of the world. He said, I'm glad God chose me before creation because he certainly would not have chose me afterwards. Don't you like that? And he chose us in Christ. It's it's right in the Bible there. He chose us for a purpose, that we would be sanctified, that we would be set apart, and that we would be without blame. In the Bible, the doctrine of election is always unto something. You're chosen for something. It's a tremendous privilege that carries great, great responsibility. Here's a question. Does the sinner respond to God's grace against his own will? Because that's where the the rub comes in. Does the sinner respond to God's grace against his own will? No. He responds because God's grace makes him willing to respond. Isn't that what happened to you? When I grew up, everybody would use those terrible curse words, GD, you know, all day long GD and Jesus Christ and so on. And I remember when I, when I was in the beginnings of being saved, uh, because I had lived that way, I spoke that way, but then somehow without, I didn't know why or how, but somehow all of a sudden I just knew there's something going on, there's something happening, there's something. And, and I kept, you know, and, I, and so to prove it to myself, I went to a little Lutheran church and they had a nice little courtyard there in Tallahassee. And I thought, well, that's a good place to go, the nice little courtyard. And I sat there because I thought, well, God's probably at this place, you know. And I, so I began to feel and think that way. And it was shortly thereafter, I was saved. And so I just responded to what was happening to me. I didn't decide I was, I didn't have any trouble with responding at all. Now, this is a very, very, very important uh, thought and truth from the Bible here that this mystery, the, the divine sovereignty and human responsibility will never be solved in life. You will never be able to figure out, to satisfy your thinking, how is it that God could choose me to become one of his children and how is it that I could also choose to make him my savior? Which, which is it? Well, it's both, isn't it? How, how, how is that that it's both? Because the Bible says it, doesn't it? The Bible says that. God gets all of the credit. I mean, when we get to heaven, uh, could you imagine meeting somebody and they would said, hey, you want to know how I got here? And I'd say, no, thank you. <laughs> Let's go back to praising Jesus Christ. So these two things go together. They're taught in the Bible. Another, and I'm paraphrasing a little story, true story of Pastor Chuck. Michael and I are, you know, we cut our teeth on Pastor Chuck's teaching. 
He tried to figure this out. How could it be that God saved me before the world was even, God chose me before the world was created, and, but then I have to make a decision to, to, save, to come to him. He, he tried to figure that out, and he, was, he said, I was trying ever so hard to figure it out, and he said, I got so frustrated that I think it was a commentary by uh, Pink, and he took this commentary he was reading, and he just threw it at the wall in anger like that, because it was driving him nuts trying to because he thought, he was very intelligent, he thought very in a linear fashion, he said, well, if it's this, it can't be, but wait a minute, it's this, how can this be that, and how, how does all of this flow together? And he was going absolutely crazy about it, and he was expressing his frustration, and he said that the Lord began to speak to him, and, uh, and, and it's important because it settled the point for him. He says, well, the Lord said, Chuck, I didn't call you to explain all of these high doctrines. I've only called you to believe them and to obey them. And Chuck said that was the end of my frustration right there. That was the end of my frustration. And he said it was the beginning of my joy in believing what God's Word says. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but th those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Uh, when you have, if I, I have, if I have a secret, I know the secret, but you don't know the secret, right? If I have a secret, it's, I have a secret, and I'm not going to tell you. Or if I'm not supposed to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. We do that too, right? Don't believe any, don't ever tell somebody a secret who says, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. Do not do that. You're already in trouble. So what he, what he says, what he's saying there is, how many things are secret? Like the virgin birth. The creation of everything that exists by, by God simply speaking it into existence. All of the great mysteries, they're not explained to us in the Bible how they work or how they, you know, how they function. God knows them and he has chosen not to reveal them to us. And I think it's because our brains are kind of puny compared to God. If you were to try to take all that info and put it in here, it might have an explosion, you know. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So when you, when you uh, as, we, as we continue on, uh, we're going to move on to the second blessing from the Father here. And as mentioned, all three members of the Godhead are involved in salvation. And as far as the Father is concerned... You were saved when he chose you in Christ in eternity past. You say, really? Uh-huh, because he's God. And he said, I've chosen you to be mine. You were saved as far as he was concerned. But that, didn't, that alone didn't, didn't save you. As far as God the Son is concerned, you were saved when he died for you on the cross. And he said, it is finished. And as far as God the Spirit is concerned, you were saved when you yielded to his conviction and received Jesus Christ as your savior. So what began in eternity past is fulfilled in time present and will continue for all eternity. The second blessing that is listed for us there in verse five is uh, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And here we meet that misunderstood word predestination. This word, as it is used in the Bible, refers primarily to what God does for saved people. It has nothing to do with unsaved people. God saved you, and guess what else he did? He predestined you to be adopted. 
There are two different truths about salvation. Uh, being chosen by God, being adopted by God, there are different aspects of what salvation is. And election seems to refer to people while predestination refers to purposes. And the word simply means to ordain beforehand to predetermine. So I'm choosing you before the world is create, even created, but my plan is I'm going to adopt you. Adoption is an act of God by which he gives his born children or born ones an adult standing in the family. Adoption, as we know it, you go to a place and adopt a child, a younger child, no doubt. But when we're adopted by God, we're, we're like adult children, as it were. You don't go into God's family, by the way, by, a, by adoption. You get into God's family by regeneration or by being born again. And all of this is according to the good pleasure of his will. And the reason he makes us full-fledged children, as it were, with all of the rights that we have, is so that we can claim the inheritance and enjoy our spiritual wealth. I'm your child. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what you did before the world was created, and I didn't know that it was according, you adopted me according to the good pleasure of your will. I've always held in high regard people who've adopted a child or children for obvious reasons. And the parents, they, they want to adopt a child. It's according to their will that they want. I want to adopt this child and this one or however it is. I want this to happen. So God wanted you to be his child and to not have to wait till your, till your, your inheritance, you know, you can begin to enjoy who you are right now as a, as a child of God. A baby can't legally use, uh, you know, the inheritance that, that is there, but an adult son can and should. So what this means is that you don't have to wait till you are an old saint before you can claim your riches in Christ. You are chosen by God. You are adopted by God. And in Romans chapter 8, let me just read these to save a little time. In Romans chapter 8, verse 22 we see a future aspect of adoption. It says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The, the, last, fat, the last facet of our salvation is when this, these bodies will be changed into a glorious spiritual body. You're saved right now, but your body sure isn't. And if you don't believe me, go look in the mirror when you get home. <laughs> or don't look in it. <laughs> You'll have a better afternoon. But your body, soul, and spirit, your body is part, you know, God gave you this body. And he saved you. You're saved. You, you have that standing with him. And one day he's going to take you either in the rapture or uh, he'll either take you before the rapture or he'll take you in the rapture or people will be taken to heaven during the tribulation period as well. But the end goal of God's salvation is that the body that you have right now is going to be transformed into a glorious body just like the body that Jesus Christ has. So adoption by God, it doesn't get any better, does it? It doesn't get any better. The third blessing from our Father is that he has accepted us. Look, it says in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So we cannot make ourselves acceptable to God, but he, as it says here, by his grace makes us accepted in Christ. And as we're sitting here today rejoicing in all of this, uh, our hearts, we're praising God. Well, thank you, God, for what you've done. We're, that, that's what is happening. 
He's the one who by his grace has made us acceptable. And being accepted, by the way, by God, is our eternal position. It's never going to change. Never going to change. God's grace in Christ were accepted before him. If you go down to verse 7, you begin to see the blessings from Jesus Christ. And I might add that we, when we talk about each member of the Godhead participating in our salvation, we should never think that they work independently of one another. They all work together for our salvation. But each one of them has a special part in our salvation. And so the, the first blessing here from the Son is that He has redeemed us. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood. In Christ, being in Christ, we have redemption. He's freed us from the slavery of sin by paying the price for our redemption. How many people here remember green stamps and that kind of thing, huh? Okay. Uh, you remember, right? You'd go to the place where all the stuff was and you'd say, oh, I want to have that thing right up there. And then you went and got your little book and you go to the grocery store and uh, stick them. In. And then they kind of, you know, got a little technical later. You could just stick them in there without licking them. And when you got enough green stamps for that item, which is it's, it's, uh, enslaved in that store. You can't just walk in and say, I want that. I really like it. They say, well, if you have, do you have four books or whatever it was? But when you get the, all the stamps, what do you do? You go in and you say, Here, here's the price for that item. So the price to redeem you, to buy you out of slavery was the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, period. Full stop, as we like to say. He paid that price for you and I. God, you know, God loved us, of course, before creation, but he couldn't just say, you know, I love you so much, and I know you're a sinner, and I know I'm holy, and I can't have sin in heaven, but somehow I'm going to make an exception. No, that won't work. He couldn't just say, I love you so much, it's okay. We got, you know, immunity. It didn't work. God is holy. In fact, God is so holy that he can't even look at sin. Do you know, while Jesus was on the earth as a man walking, God was always talking to him. Jesus was always listening to him. The Father was watching him, and he watched him live a perfect life. He watched him go to the cross, and he was crucified on the cross, and, and he was watching him even then. And then, when God took our iniquities and placed them upon Jesus Christ, God withdrew his gaze upon Jesus, and Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's how holy God is. He couldn't even look at his own son when his own son, who knew no sin, became sin for us. We've been redeemed. I always used to enjoy singing the songs with redemption. I knew it meant something good. I didn't quite know what it meant, but I'd sing it. Boy, we've been redeemed. <laughs> I knew it meant something good. Uh, we were singing today, whom, whom the sun sets free. You're no longer in the green stamp store. Somebody says, how are you doing? Say, you know, ever since I got out of the green stamp store, I have been doing really good. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, can I explain it to you? Yeah, let me explain it to you. The second blessing from the sun is in the last part of verse 7, that simply he has forgiven us. In him we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The word forgive literally means to carry away, to carry away. It reminds us of the Jewish ritual on the Day of Atonement when the high priest would take a goat and they would slay this goat, they would take the blood from this goat, they had two goats. They would take the first goat and slay the goat, take the blood from the goat, and go in and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And by, what, a, what a thought. God says, 
the mercy seat, you know, the Ark of the Covenant and the top part of it, he said that's the mercy seat. God said, that's where I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you with my mercy. How about that? Hmm? I'm going to meet you with my mercy. So they would take that blood and they'd sprinkle it there, and then they'd take the other goat and they would put their hands on the head of this goat as a symbol of all the sins of the people of Israel. We're putting them on this goat now, and they sent that goat away. They sent that goat away. He was called the scapegoat. They would confess all the sins of Israel over this live goat, and then they would take it into the wilderness and it would be lost forever. That's why our sins are gone. <laughs> when Christ paid for our sins, they were paid for. They're gone. How about that? How about that? So Christ died to carry away our sins so that they might never be seen again. Um, do you know the Bible actually says in the book of Hebrews that somehow God who is omniscient, uh, he, he forgets our sins. He doesn't even remember them. It's just, it's just somehow the it's, it's way that God describes our standing. He doesn't even remember them. But why should he if they're gone? You and I, on the other hand, we, we remember them, don't we? And I'll bet you God says every time you say, you know, Lord, I was so bad back then. I did this and that. And he's saying, what is the matter with you? What, what are you talking about? We say, well, don't you remember what I did? Yeah, I do, but I don't actually. Don't you remember what Christ did for you? He paid for those sins. They're gone. They're gone. Uh, they're gone, gone, gone. How about that? So the second thing, you know, how are you doing? Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm out of the green stamp store and I'm also gone. Away from my sins. The third blessing from the, the son, and this is so wonderful, in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. And um, let me, it says in verse 8, well, he, actually, he's revealed God's will for us, his future will for us. And by the way, let me say, I think most of us, we don't think about God's will beyond, once we get to heaven, I don't think we think about what's going to happen beyond heaven and what's going to happen when, when everybody gets to heaven. How's all that going to work? We don't really think about it too much, but there's an infinite future ahead of us. And so going to heaven is just the beginning. There's an infinite, never-ending existence that God has for us. And he, he reveals a lot of that right here in verses 8 through 10. He says, um, in verse 8, it says... Um, let me read 7 and 8 and through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Here it is. Having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. This is what he's going to do. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that God has this period of time called the dispensation of the fullness of times. Look, this is what's going to happen. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, people in heaven, and which are on earth in him. God is actually, in salvation, creating a brand new a brand new humanity, if you want to call it, a brand new people. And it'll be those who are in Christ. And other things won't be there, like the world is going to be dissolved because it's corrupted as well because of sin. But everything that is in Christ, that's, and, and that's only everything that is in Christ, will be part of the new eternal future that we have. Isn't that something? 
it's really something. <laughs> it's funny, you know, I, I, I've been a Christian a while now, and this is something I just kind of started realizing this last year, and it's just thrilling to think about it. Uh, when you get to be my age, you are thinking more about uh, when you're going to depart for heaven. Then when you're younger, you don't even worry about that. You know, think about it. But I tell you, I am so excited about the future because I know that any moment, uh, be it a sickness, an accident, whatever it might be, I'm going to depart for heaven. I, I'm, I mean, I'm actually so thrilled about it. And uh, I think about it a lot, and usually several times a week I'll, I'll realize... I could go to heaven today. I literally could go today. I often, you could see it in my journal, I'll say, Father, you alone know the exact day, the place, the circumstance, the time when I'm making my departure. And I know you're not going to tell me, but, uh, you know, what a thrill. There's a story uh, of a uh, lady who was dying in the hospital, and uh, the pastor was visiting her, and the, the lady wanted the pastor to, uh, she wanted to work with the pastor to prepare her, her uh, service, you know, her memorial service, and so they went over the songs, and who was going to speak, and this and that, and, and then she said, oh, pastor, I one, one last thing. He said, what's that? She said, you know, when they put you there, and they're going to have an open ca uh, casket, and she said, when I'm, when I'm laying in there, and my hands are like this, would you put a spoon in my hands right here, sticking this way, a spoon. He said, pardon me? She said, yeah, I want you to take a spoon and put it in my hand. So, because what do people do at the end of the service? They do, they do what? They walk by the casket, don't they? And, and he, she's telling him this, and he says, oh, okay. And she says, well, when they see the spoon, I want them to know that the best is yet to come. It's dessert, right? So, what a future we have. What a future we have. There's the, you, you can't buy it, you can't make it, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it. It's all by His grace. So God has revealed His will to us, and, and uh, He goes on, actually, in verse 11 and 12, to speak about our inheritance, in verse 11 it says this, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, there it is again, or planned for us, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. I remember a little while ago during the worship, Hunter was, and by the way, should we give a real big, big thank you, applause to the worship team here, because man, oh man, It doesn't get much better, folks. Look at this beautiful place. All the nice rooms have been painted. Everything's in good shape. It's a thrill. But we, we have an inheritance. We've obtained this inheritance. And it's, he's planned it out according to the per, his own purpose. And he happens to be the one who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. We're going to have this inheritance because he's working it out. It's according to the counsel of his own will. And the reason for it is in verse 12 that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. You know, if you, you might have an inheritance that's based on the stock market and you're hoping that things are still steady once that person passes on. No, no problems with God. Everything's squared away. Uh, and, uh, uh, Hunter's dad, is it Greg? Yeah, Greg was, uh, the, he read there in, Matthew, in Malachi, and talked about in, in Matthew, no rust, no corrupt, nothing's going to, all the treasures we have are right there, they're solid, they're being, he's keeping them, they're not going away anywhere, and uh, they're there for us.
Some people, good Bible scholars, believe that this word inheritance could also be uh, believed this way, that we are God's inheritance. You know, we are, we are God's gift to his son. We're the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And the book of Jude says he's going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. You know, the father sent him here to save us. And we become his bride. And when he gets us to heaven, he's going to say, look, father, I, here they are. Look, at I, I've, I've saved them. I haven't even lost one of them. And here they are. I'm presenting them before you, before the presence of your glory. And so to think that in some way uh, that could be God's inheritance. I mean, he doesn't need anything, doesn't want anything, but, but still it it's, could be that. It, either way, it's nice to know that it's either that way or the other way that we have an inheritance. Uh, and then we have just a few more minutes, Michael. Just a few more, okay. I want to, because I know people here are going to kill me if I don't mention the, the blessings from the Holy Spirit because... <laughs> I taught this once a while ago, and, and uh, I want, to, want you to look with me, please, in this chapter, in verse 13. In him, you also, we've looked at the Father's blessings, the Son's blessings, and now we're going to look at the Holy Spirit's blessings in salvation. In him, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, our bodies, to the praise of his glory. So Paul here is speaking to them uh, about what he knew really had happened to them. And, you know, he knew the Christians that had been there when he was there, and he didn't, he was assuming that many others had been saved, and, but he's speaking now with confidence to the Christians in, in Ephesus about what the Holy Spirit's done in their life, and the reason he has this confidence that the Holy Spirit has sealed them is right here in verse 13. Number one, you trusted, they, you, you trusted after you heard the word of truth. You trusted in God's word. You trusted in God's word. The gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also having believed, that's another uh, way you can know if somebody's saved, they trusted in the gospel, trusted in the word of truth, and having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So when you become, when, you, when you're saved, right at the very moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and he indwells your life. He indwells the believer. He does that to secure you. He does that to preserve you and to preserve his eternal, your eternal salvation. The sealing of which Paul is speaking here refers to an official mark of identification placed on a letter, a contract, or a document back in that day. That document was thereby officially under the authority of the person whose stamp was on the seal. You'd look at this parcel, whatever it might be, they'd have you know, their insignia ring and they'd put some wax there and they'd put their family ring in there and they'd say, oh, that, that belongs to the Joneses and this belongs to that person and whatnot. And, and when you looked at it, you knew that, you knew that this item here was under the authority of that person. In this case, it's God. Because the Holy Spirit is a stamp. It's a seal. He is a seal in our life. There are four primary truths signified by the seal. This is so wonderful. Number one, it speaks of security. When you see a package like that, it's like paying for insurance, you paid insurance to make sure it would get there. And in Daniel 6, 17, it says that. In Matthew 27, 62 through 66, it says that. The Holy Spirit in you is a sign of your security with God. Number two, 
It speaks of the authenticity of what's happened to you. The Holy Spirit does not live in an unbeliever. In Romans chapter 8, it says, uh, can't quote it exactly now. I've kind of lost a lot of my, my uh, memory when it comes to, what are we talking about? No, I, I, <laughs> I can't quote it, but it's in, it's in uh, uh, Romans 8. It says, uh, you can't say, that he that has not this, the Holy Spirit is not a child of God. And it says that. So when you got saved, the, the, you know, the Father's in heaven and, and Jesus' body's in heaven, but the Holy Spirit came, whoo, he came and he was, he he came into your life. So you have this seal in your life. And so, though God is omniscient and knows everything, when he sees you, he knows, well, that one's secure because there's my Holy Spirit. That one's real. It's authentic because the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of an unbeliever. And the third significance of the Holy Spirit is ownership. That's my child right there. And lastly, it speaks of authority. How nice is that? And you know, how, do you, well, how, how does all this work? Well, you know, when people get saved, they get changed, they get religion, however you want to call it, and they start acting differently, and the Bible calls it the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You never, ever acted the way you act now as a Christian before you were a Christian. I mean, you might have been a nice person or not. You might have done nice things or not. You might have been really good or not. But when you became a Christian, you now had a relationship with God. You had communion with God. Um, you have a relationship with Him. And he, he's producing in your life what's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Like, you know how you can go meet some, maybe it's the waiter at the restaurant, and you say, I think that waiter's a Christian. How could you even think that? Well, there's something about Christians, isn't it? It's in the eyes, you can see it, there's, it's in the countenance. In fact, the other day we were at a store down in, uh, we're at 73 degrees every day down in Southern California, <laughs> um, South Orange County, but... Uh, we were at a, a store, and the young man, Carlos was his name, uh, he was so nice, nice young guy, and he helped us to purchase what we were purchasing. And uh, I, I told him, I said, hey, Carlos, I said, you really look like you know what you're doing here, man. And he said, oh, I do. I said, uh, it's, you, you've got it, you know. I mean, like when you see a policeman who should be a policeman in uniform, he looks like he should be in uniform, right? And if he shouldn't be a policeman, he doesn't look good in the uniform, right? <laughs> Because it's something you can see when somebody's got it. They have that X factor. So I said, congratulations. He said, oh, yeah, I've been here three years. And I said, yeah, you're headed for big things. I said, well, congratulations, you know. So then we left, and then I called the store back, and I said, is Carlos there, please? They said, sure. I said, Carlos, it's Bob. I was just there causing all kinds of problems. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, we thank you that you're gone. Uh, <laughs> And I said, you know, there was one thing I wanted to ask you, and I didn't get, but you can look up. I said, one thing I wanted to ask you, are you a Christian? He said, I sure am. I said, are you a real Christian? He said, yes, sir. I said, are you a born again Christian? He said, I sure am. And he's a young guy. He said, I read the book, he called it, every night before I go to bed. He said, didn't you see my tattoo, Philippians 4.13? I said, no. And I quoted it to him. He said, whoa. And I said, well, yeah, I'm a pa I'm a pastor. I was a pastor. He said, oh, wow. I said, do you have a church? He said, yeah. He said, it's five minutes from here. I said, is it Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, which is five minutes from uh, the name of that place where we were? I can never think of it now. But uh, I said, uh, yeah, Pastor Chuck Smith. And he said, he knew of Pastor Chuck Smith. And, and so he's going, wow, wow. He said, you mean you knew I was a Christian? I said, well, I sure thought you were. He said, yeah. He said, you know, there's like this energy from God, isn't there? Now, that's, these are words that he's using. He's a new believer. But he knows you see something in people. Listen, God Almighty is living inside of you. The eyes are the window to the soul. Uh, there, there's a communion. We're in the body of Christ together. So the Holy Spirit, he produces fruit in your life. The love of God, so on and so forth. So when God looks at you, he says, oh yeah, that one's for real. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one's authentic. Yeah, and I own that one. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
And they're secure, all right, because it goes on to tell us here in verse 14, the second thing the Holy Spirit is, in addition to being the seal, which is a, the, the Holy Spirit of promise, in verse 14 it says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The, uh, the guarantee, the guarantee. You know, when you uh, purchase a home, you have to put some money down on the home, right? And they're holding the home for you. It's your home, but you're not living there yet. But when you pay the full price, they give you the keys and now you go into your home, right? You get it. The Holy Spirit in our life is a guarantee of the inheritance that he's been talking about, we are going to receive that inheritance. Why? Because the, the earnest money, the escrow has been paid. So you don't really possess the home when just you've given them a little bit of money, but you, it is yours, but you don't possess it yet. And God is going to redeem, it says the redemption of the purchased possession. When God takes us in the rapture or however he takes us in a death, an accident or whatever, that's when everything that is our inheritance, we can be sure there's no quite, I don't know whether when you get to heaven, they say, now, first stop is let's go talk to Jesus personally. I don't know. I tell you what, I am putting in a request for duty in heaven. I would like to be a greeter in heaven. Uh, I, I think St. Peter's been doing this a long time, and I thought, I'd like to ask him, take a break, Pete. And, uh, and I bet you in heaven, you, the greeters know who's coming today. And I will know who, who are my friends that are coming. I can get all of their friends up and say, hey, guess who's coming? I would love to greet people coming into the, the kingdom of God, wouldn't you? I mean, what, wouldn't you go to a church and they've got nice greeters here like Ricky? You have greeters that are happy and joyful and sincere. And, you, you know, people come to church because they need something. Right? I don't need to go into all of what that need is. But how nice to be greeted by somebody. Welcome, glad you're here. Can you imagine what it's like going through that gate? I, uh, we can't, but uh, it's nice to think about. So the Holy Spirit is the seal that we belong to God, that he's the authority in our life. And, and, uh, and the, the Holy Spirit is also the guarantee that one day our bodies are going to be changed and then salvation will be complete in our life. Isn't that something? Well, Father, thank you so much for your word today in our lives. And I, I don't know if... Uh, I, I would assume that not everybody that's here knows Jesus the way we've been talking about it. If, if you don't know Jesus, I just wanted to say a couple of things to you. I would like you to know that he, he actually does invite you to know him. The Bible, that's the Bible's message. Jesus wants you to, to know him. That's what becoming a Christian is all about. It's to know Jesus. It's to know the Father. And how that happens, the Bible says in the Gospel of John in the first 13 verses, that whoever receives Christ, whoever receives Christ becomes his child. So Christ wants to be received by you. And if you receive Christ, you embrace Christ, you give yourself to Christ, you will become his child. You can't become his child by being a good person, blah, blah, blah. But you become a child of God. You become saved by receiving Christ. So if you do not, know, if you know today, you know, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have that relationship like he's talking about. Well, you can. God wants you to. He died for you. He died not only for our sins, it says in 1 John chapter 2, but he died for the sins of the whole world. And you can receive him. You turn to him. You, you, your whole thinking is changed. You realize, you realize who you are, what you've done, and you realize what Christ did. You receive him. 
You, you give yourself to Jesus. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to stand up or anything like that at the moment, but or really at any moment. You need to receive Christ. And I'll tell you, the, there's pastors here in this church, there's ministers, and uh, they'll be more than happy to help you, uh, you know, to, to help you in that process, okay? I sure have enjoyed myself more than you can realize here today, and I praise God for being here.